All right, I've been getting a lot of comments about the WNBA draft, so figured I might as well look at some of these mock drafts, talk about it with you guys a little bit more since I only focused on one pick, which was the Indiana Fever pick with um, Citron is who I went with on that one. But let's look at all the prospects, and let's start with the ESPN's mock draft here. So what do we have? Obviously, Paige Becker's number one, right, to Los Angeles. I'm hoping she goes to Dallas. I mean, Paige Becker's going number one is a no-brainer, but I'm hoping that Dallas actually gets that pick. Why? Just because I want Kiki Iriafin to stay in L.A., which she is projected as a number two pick. Makes sense to me. We may see somebody rise into that number two spot like we saw Camila Cardoso rise pretty late. I know it was mock boards last season, so we may see, but I'm thinking she'll hold that number two spot, hopefully to L.A. Number three, <clears throat> they're looking at the Chicago Sky going with Anissa Morrow. And I'm not sure about that. We saw her and Angel Reese play together at LSU. Both of their numbers took a little bit of a hit when she transferred. She was averaging like 22 and 12 or something like that at DePaul. Angel Reese was up too. And then both of their numbers took a dip playing together. And their games are kind of redundant, especially with Camila Cardoso already being in Chicago. That's a lot of rebounding, not a lot of outside shooting. And, you know, a lot of draft capital, high draft capital going to a lot of redundancy. So there is some overlap between Morrow and Angel Reese on the court and off the court as well. Seeing as how she's from Chicago, she should quickly become a, a fan favorite, in my opinion. And, you know, visually, it's, there's a lot of overlap between the two. If they do draft Anissa, let's just say that $8,000 that she's paying for her apartment in Chicago, she could probably find the same thing for about... 7000 in Vegas with no state taxes. So, yeah, you could pretty much put the countdown on her in an Aces jersey, in my opinion. That's just the way I see it playing out. Ooh, FUD number four. That's that UConn bias that I'm talking about right there. Never mind the fact that she's a junior. I'll talk about juniors in a second, but that's that UConn bias that. How is FUD the number four pick? Not in my mind. I mean, maybe in some people's mind. That's strict. That's a reach. Yeah, that that's a reach in my opinion. But if Washington does that, more power to them. I don't, I don't really see it. I mean, I guess ceiling. You're looking at a Kayla McBride type player, but it's not just the injuries. It's also just the production. Lottery pick. I don't see it. That's all I'll say. Olivia Miles, number five. All right, another junior. I'm not so sure all of these juniors are going to go into the draft, me personally. Not so sure all of these juniors are going, even though I'm seeing them put there on the boards. Doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Same thing with Janiah Barker down there at number eight to the fever. The reason why it doesn't make a lot of sense to me, they're going to opt out more than likely. They're going to opt out and negotiate a new CBA, which goes into effect which would go into effect in 2026. And so if they do so, why would you want to be on a four-year rookie contract under the old one? Yeah, I'm not sure that would be retroactive to the people who signed a rookie deal in 2025. So I would rather be under that new CBA, which I'm sure is going to have a higher pay scale. I would rather avoid the Page Beckers and Juju Watkins draft and slide right in between those in that 26 draft. And... We're seeing some of these numbers that's being thrown around in the transfer portal. And just to recruit new freshmen, we're seeing 800,000. We're seeing Aaliyah Chavez reportedly being asking for a million. That's what made LSU drop out. But Texas, somebody in Texas is going to pay it. Either Texas or Texas Tech, they're going to pay it. Yeah, unless you're one of the players that has a really big endorsement deal with Nike or Gatorade, I don't see why you would enter the draft and be possibly the number five, number six number eight player in the draft where you can just go back to school and be a much higher draft pick under the new CBA. That's just my opinion. But anyway, Olivia Miles at number five for the Golden State Valkyries does make a lot of sense. That's the kind of player you want to start your franchise with for sure. I think that Chicago actually should draft Miles. That's the kind of point guard they need to come and kind of organize that. Cheyenne Sellers at number six. That's a good pick. That's a good pick. I would actually like to see the fever get somebody like a sellers or like citron like i said somebody that can play one through three but that's not a bad pick for washington 
New York Liberty with Malanga makes sense because they can afford to stash a player for a couple of years. She doesn't turn 19 until November. Yeah, they can afford to stash her. Not many teams. Indiana Fever, they need somebody to come and produce right now. It wouldn't make sense for them to draft somebody like Malanga. But for the New York Liberty, that makes perfect sense. So now we have Janaya Barker at number eight. Now she's another player. And I know that she said that she was going to come out after her junior year. That was before the NIL rules changed. So now schools can pay you directly. It's not just outside endorsements. I'm not so sure that I would come out if I was her. 12 and 7. You're expecting to see a junior leap, but when you go to a team as deep as UCLA, it's not a lot of room for improvement. And so I've seen her as high as like two on some draft boards, but we'll get to those when we get to them. But if we can get, and by we, I mean as an Indiana Fever fan, obviously, if we can get Barker at the number eight pick, I'm all for it. I'm all for it. I just don't think that if she does enter the draft, she'll be available there. So I'm looking more at Citrone because when we're talking about Harmon at 5'6 point guard, who's kind of pesky, Seattle Storm, knock yourself out. Chicago Sky with Tahina, I mean, she's a knockdown shooter for sure. Wouldn't mind seeing her coming off of the bench and, you know, knocking down 45% of her three-pointers for the season, season after season. But I would rather see them get a big guard who can play one through three, like Citrone, like Sellers, like Sanaya Rivers. You know, stay away from the five, six guards like Amore and Harmon, in my opinion. Nothing against them at all, but right now the only five, six guard I'm really a fan of is Hannah Hidalgo. And, you know, I like Zam. I think Zam Jones is a little bit bigger than five, six, though. I'm not really in love with the sh super short guards. That's just a me thing. So, yeah, that's, that's ESPN's draft, you guys. Let's take a look at the Knicks, because they have some good writers here. Hunter Cruz, I've seen a lot of his videos on YouTube, actually. He's uh, pretty good with his scouting. There's about 70, 75% of his takes that I agree with. And that's a really high number. I don't really agree with too many people on that much. So, I mean, if you're batting 50-50 with me, you're, you're watchable. You're good. So, for him to be like 70-30 in my opinion, 75-25, I'm right on board. Anyway, I'm rambling. Let's look. Paige Becker's number one. We know that. Now, they have Janiah Barker at number two. I'm just not so convinced, you guys, that Janiah Barker, I'm not as high as, on Janiah Barker as everybody else is. To me, it's a lot of speculation. You have to go out there and produce. 12 and 7. 12 and 7. Let's, here, let's look at her stats. Really quickly. All right. Her first year, Texas A&M. 12.7 points, 6 total rebounds in 22 minutes. That's not bad at all. Sophomore year, they gave her around 4 more minutes per game. You know, she started 20 more games. Her points dipped 0.5 points. You know, she gained 1.6 more rebounds. So we're looking at 12 and 7, even with 4 more minutes. Her free throws went down. That's what bothers me. Um... Did the low free throw percentage dissuade her from wanting to get fouled? That happens. And if so, that's bothersome to me for somebody who hasn't produced more than 12 points a game. That tells me that, you know, these star projections are maybe a little high. She's not going to be a volume scorer if she's not willing to put them up or if she's trying to avoid getting fouled. Maybe it might just be her penchant for pulling up in the mid-range, which she's really good at. But, you know, you start shooting half less free throws than you did the year before. That's bothersome to me. And I don't see her getting a lot more touches at UCLA to see that production go up. When you look at all the best players in the WNBA right now, at some point they produced at a high level in college. Every last one. Asia Wilson, Brianna Stewart, Nafisa Collier, you name them. Even just looking at the fever, we saw what Caitlin Clark did from freshman year all the way to her senior year, averaging 31 and 10 almost. Um, we saw Nalissa Smith, her last couple of seasons, she was averaging 22 and 12 basically. Leah Boston, we saw what she did. Kelsey Mitchell averaged 24 her whole career through college. So there's not many players who are really good in the WNBA right now who were putting up 12 and 7, no matter who was around and what team they were on. So if she comes out this season and puts up another 12 and 8 at UCLA, yeah, I can't go with that star projection that a lot of other 
outlets and people seem to have on her. All right, let's look at some of Barker's advanced numbers here because I think I can find this same type of value a lot lower in the draft, and we'll talk about that. Uh, her per, per 40 minutes, 19.8, right? 11.1 .1 rebounds. That's cool. Her offensive rating, 95.5. Defensive rating, 83.2. The lower the better on the defensive rating. So keep these numbers in mind. If you can, as I switch over to a person who I think should be higher on a lot of mock draft boards right now, or at least on a lot of teams draft boards, who cares about the mock draft boards, but Rhea Marshall, in my opinion, if not first round, definitely second round, she's shown her entire career that she's a double-double player. We're not talking about seven rebounds. She's going out there, you know, obviously her scoring went down some when Juju Watkins came over because her attempts went from 13 to 8.8. .8. And they've only gotten deeper, but even with that deep team, she still gave you a double-double, as she has for pretty much every season of her career. As a rim protector, you can see she's getting a lot of blocks. 2.5 her freshman season, 3.5 at her highest. Last season, it dipped down some to just two, but she projects as a really good rim protector. She's also getting you steals. She's just as good from the mid-range. The only thing that she really doesn't do as well as Barker is shoot threes, but... She's shown that she has a nice touch. We look at her advanced metrics, same way we did Barker's. You know, a few less points at 16.3, but a lot more rebounds. And those defensive numbers are crazy. That's exactly what the Indiana Fever need. Somebody like her. Rim protection for days. Her uh, per 100 possessions. Her offensive rating is higher than Barker's. And her defensive rating a lot lower. So to me, as opposed to a second, third, fourth, even an eighth pick, Going for Janiah Barker, I would look at Rhea Marshall in the second round. That's just me. Zaza James, too. Zaza James from NC State. She's not high on a lot of people's draft boards. To me, she's like a poor man's Kelsey Mitchell. She's not going to get you 24 a game or 20 a game in the WNBA. But, you know, subtract about six points. Same, same style, constantly attacking. That pretty left-hand jumper. You close out, she's going to calmly uh, reposition herself. And just knock down a jumper somewhere else. I mean, she's relentless going to the rim. Look for Zaza James and Rhea Marshall to climb a lot of people's draft boards if they listen to me. All right, so let's get back to this who's next mock draft board. Janiah Barker at two. They have Kiki Iriafin at three. I don't really have a problem with that. Olivia Miles at four. Like I said, I believe that's who Chicago should be looking at. I don't have a problem with that. Once we get into these international players, I have very limited you know, exposure and knowledge about them. So I'll just say salute. You know, I've seen them in a few FIBA games, and that's about it. Um, Tahina, Raven, again, no problem against any of these South Carolina guards. I've seen it, though. I've seen it over in L.A. They, they, they play a role their entire time in college, and so it's kind of hard for them to step up and just be, you know, anything other than that once they get into the WNBA. But not bad picks there. I would much rather have Sanaya Rivers or Citron at the eight pick. And like I said, if Barker's available, absolutely. I would love to see her at the uh, number eight pick. I don't think she will be. All right, Leisure Walker. She's another very good player who will be at UCLA. That's why I said I don't expect to see Barker's numbers go up. They got some really good transfers and some um, really good freshmen coming in. I don't want I don't want her though. Obviously we have Caitlin Clark. You're not gonna spend a, a draft pick on a primary ball handler like that. Quinterly has an off ball guard at five eight. Can't really slide over to the three. Not really a good point guard. She's just a secondary ball handler and an attacker. We already have Kelsey Mitchell. Don't necessarily need that. She's somebody I would look into for a player that can come in and play three positions as a utility wing, as they say here, a wing stopper as they say here, and it's definitely true. I watched her in Michigan, Big Ten all the way over here. So Anissa Morrow at 13, that's surprising, and that's very honest too because, you know, a lot of people just have her in the top three or four automatically without even putting any thought into it, and I'm not 100% sure that she's that high. 13 is a bit low. To me, she's somewhere in the middle for sure, but not necessarily the number three pick in my opinion. I wouldn't put her as low as 13 either, though. I'll probably have her, you know, I'll probably have her around here at the sixth spot. Malanga, 
at the 14. If Malanga's available for the Indiana Fever and they know that she'll come over right away, I wouldn't be mad if they picked her, if they just took a swing. Because at the number eight pick, if you look traditionally, these aren't players who are making a huge impact. I mean, we, we saw Peely over in Minnesota this year, didn't even play. We could look just look back at the last few drafts for the last five years. I don't want to start throwing names out there. <laughs> and, you know, definitely want to be shitting on anybody. But, all right, this year's number eight pick, like I mentioned before, Alyssa Peely. We haven't seen her play at all. Um, she's a crowd favorite. You know, she has a lot of fans from Utah. But she didn't play at all this year. Hopefully she gets some clock next year. Let's look at last year's number eight pick. Am I here? Am I even here? Am I even here? All right. I don't think so. 2022. Maya Hollingshed. All right. I mean, she was good in college. All of these players are good in college. I'm talking about their impact in the league. What have they done since they've come into the league is what I'm looking at. I'm not trying to diss anybody. But Maya Hollingshed, that's not an impact player right now. Shyla Hill from Australia is a point guard. I mean, if you look at the players after these picks, too, it's not like, oh, they just missed that number eight. There is nothing that you see behind them that would have really made a difference either. So I didn't really point that out in the previous years. But if you go back and you look at those names underneath the number eight pick, it's not like these are just misses. And there was a, a diamond at number 10 or something like that. All right. Ruthie Hebert. Decent. This is not what we're looking for right now. If we're the Indiana Fever looking to make a run next year, none of these names, none of the impact that they've had. And this isn't really a crazy deep draft either. Maybe that 2027 draft at seven or eight, you'll find something really good, like a franchise player at seven or eight. But even getting Angel Reese at seven was great for Chicago this year. All right, now this draft, 2019, gives you some hope because you see. Nafisa Collier at number six. You see Alana Smith at number eight. You see Ezzy McBagor at 12. These are all players you wouldn't mind having. I'll give you that. 2019 was a, was a really nice draft from, from six down. But most of these other players that you're looking at from eight down, it's not really anything that we should be banking on as an Indiana Fever fan base. Somebody that's going to come in and just like make a huge difference, in my opinion. Like, this is all just my opinion. And you guys let me know yours in the comments. I could be absolutely wrong. And we could get a really high value player. Like I said, Janai Barker, maybe she could reach her ceiling. And maybe she could be available at the A spot. But I think if she does reach her ceiling, we'll start to see that this year. And she won't be available at the A spot. So, taking a swing on a player, I'm not opposed to that. Or just picking a player with a super high floor like Citron. I'm definitely not mad at that. Georgia Moore. Is it Amore or Amore? I'm going to go with Amore. I've heard it said both ways. 5-5 five, five point guards. Knock yourself out. Bree Hall. I love Bree Hall. I wouldn't even have her necessarily as the third South Carolina guard on this list. Me personally. She's a leader. She just has like some intangibles, not to mention that 6'5 wingspan, but she has some really good intangibles. You'd have to just listen to her speak off the court and see her uh, compose around the court to know what I'm talking about there. But I actually like Bree Hall a lot higher than um, maybe whoever put this list together, um, Hunter Cruz and the other two people there. All right, Cheyenne Sellers at 17. I'm not mad at that at all. I would pick her before that personally over a lot of these players that I have listed, but I'm not mad at that at all. I would probably have her at 12 myself, 12 between nine and 12. But this is about where I think she is. This is why I was surprised to see her at number four on the ESPN list. Like, what are we talking about there? This is without any UConn bias. 18 is fair. All right. We're going to Spain and we're going to Russia. That's above me. I don't really think I need to dig this low on the draft here, you guys. Maddie Sherr and Lucy Olsen, though. I would love to see one of those co uh, play it in the Indiana for a second or third round pick. All right. I'm everywhere right now. Sorry, you guys. I didn't put a lot of uh, pre-production of thought into this video. I'm just kind of winging it here. Just had a few tabs open. <laughs> Wanted to have a conversation with you guys. There's been a lot going on. 
that I won't saddle you with. We're not here to trauma dump, but boy, with all of these floods and everything going on, sports has been one of the last things on my mind, even though I have tapped in. Stay tapped in. All right, Janaya Barker. This is the Indy Star talking about some players that the Fever should pick up. All right. Now, Fever President Kelly, she's emphasizing the need for experience in the starting lineup. And this is why I'm not going for a lot of power fours in the in the draft. Is I'm on that same page. And can I talk about how much I love the Indiana Fever just as a franchise? Just for one second. Because when I came out and I talked about the way they were shooting their press conferences, post-game, pre-game, things changed almost immediately. I was talking about you know, some of their rotations and moves that you guys thought they should make as well with Melissa Smith. And we saw a little bit of a change almost immediately. We saw them go from emphasizing post-play and we have to play through A-B to talking about pace, 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 which we already knew as, you know, watching Caitlin Clark throughout her whole college and career. Things changed immediately. Their social media team improved after it was criticized by myself and others on social media. Things changed immediately. Like, they made so many great moves, even during the uh, Olympic break. A lot of people were talking about getting rid of Coach Christy Sides, but I made a video saying, hey, we we have to address the GM first. Lynn Dunn's got to go. Things change immediately after the season. I've never been a fan of a franchise who's done so many things, like, rapidly, the right things, or at least in my opinion. But it's great being a fan of the Indiana Fever right now for me. So, so I'm in full agreement with Kelly. We absolutely need some experience in the starting lineup. We don't have time to develop a, an eighth pick to try to make a deep playoff run next to Aaliyah Boston, in my opinion. As a 7th or 8th player, 6th or 7th player in the rotation, sure. And that's why I like somebody like Sellers or Citron who can play 1 through 3. But looking at possibly taking Janaya Barker and just plopping her into the starting lineup, thinking she's going to replace Melissa Smith, who averaged 10 and 7 last season. No. Right now, Janaya Barker is not even as good as Melissa Smith was her junior year. And that was three years ago, four years ago. I'm pretty sure Smith is a little bit better. Even though Smith was shooting 79% from the free throw line for a couple years in a row, her junior and senior year in Baylor. I'm not sure what's happened with that. I don't know if she's not in the gym getting those free throws up or what, but she was a good free throw shooter before. But anyway, yeah, I don't think Barker can just step in and fill that spot like people think she can. I don't think she'll be available in the eighth spot anyway. Anissa Morrow, I don't think she'll be available in the eighth spot either. What are we talking about here? I mean, if they move up somehow through the Smith trade, you know, that first round pick, which I suggested in the comments, um, then we could talk about Anissa Morrow. I think that'd be a great pick because unlike Janiah Barker, she's shown that she can produce at a high level. I already know she can put up 22 and 11 in college and possibly in the uh, WNBA. Maddie Westbell, I love it as a second round pick. As a second round pick, not in the first round, she'd have to show a lot. She started the season injured right now this year. I mean, they're very deep, so it's not like we're going to see her numbers explode this season. Citrone, you already know how I feel about her. Let's just look at what they're saying here. Citrone could fit in as a wing at the three spot and seem similar to Lexi Ho in multiple ways. Sharpshooter from the three-point range, and she averaged 17.3 points per game last season. Her best year with the Irish. Unlike like Leho, though, she's a better playmaker. She, You won't see her picking up the ball in the middle of the floor too many times and looking for help. She's either going to create something for somebody else, get all the way to the rim, get into her pull-up bag. Very few times where you see her just, like, stopped and, like, looking around, which, you know, we have seen with Lexi Ho a lot this season. I'm hoping that she works on that in the offseason, gets better at taking that extra dribble or two to either get all the way to the rim and kick it out and create or get a step back some kind of counter move, but right now she's not very good creating on ball. Sanaya Rivers, I would love her as a pick, honestly. She has a physical advantage as far as somebody you can't stay in front of. Her speed is next level with the ball in her hands or in transition, you know, as an off-ball cutter or whatever, but especially with the ball in her hands. We're talking about Kennedy Carter, Kalea Copper type. You can't stay in front of her. She's going to cause a rotation pretty much every single time she attacks with the ball and having her and Kelsey Mitchell, that's two players who you can't stay in front of. I'm not mad at Sanaya Rivers at all at like a number eight pick, but all right, Satu Sabli. Now I've made a video about wanting to grab her too, obviously as a free agent. They're talking about making a trade for her. I mean, if we're talking about Melissa Smith maybe, but typically teams won't core a player who already lists them know that they don't want to be there. 
or if they do it'll definitely be a signing trade so i'm not really worried about the fact that they could court her they can make that trade happen no matter what if she desires to go you just don't see that in the wnba where they hold on to a player that doesn't want to be there rather they're court or not we saw that with the chicago sky this year and with Kalea copper once they ask out they pretty much let you out so we'll see what happens with her it sounds like she's ready to move on they moved on from their coach and gm already so it just makes sense that we'll start a rebuild but we'll see if we can uh, use that eighth pick just to secure the satu trade i'm not i'm not opposed to that not opposed to that at all but we shall see i guess that's all the indy star has for us but we'll see how it plays out we've already heard from kelly we saw what she said about needing some experience in the starting lineup i completely agree I'm trying to go in there with A.B., somebody like an Ezzy McBagore, who's already become the player that she is now and not will be six years from now. That's what I'm looking for. But we'll see how it all plays out, what they get back in the potential in the Alyssa Smith trade or any other possible deals that may happen. So just wanted to touch bases on that before the season is over. I'm looking forward to the college season. Some of these scrimmages have already been amazing. Joyce Edwards, I'm so glad. Well, let me not say that. <laughs> Let me not say that. But Ashley Watkins being out the way means Joyce Edwards gets to play. And I, I love it. Give her all the minutes in the world. Signing out, you guys. See you on the next one. Did I say signing out? Who the fuck am I?